said, it's going to be a great night. Been trying to get Colonel Jefferson here for a couple of years. Uh, his reputation precedes him. And, uh, and I think this would be a great night for Brooks Cleaver as well. When these readings are dedicated to and named after. Brooks uh, is the former U.S. Army Assistant Chief of Military History. He also serves as the Deputy Chief Historian of the Center for Military History and the Chief Historian for the Continental Army Command, which later became the Training and Doctrine Command. During World War II, this is why Dr. Cleaver would be thrilled to the speaker we have tonight. During World War II, Brooks was assigned to the 90th Infantry Division in the European Theater of Operations. Shortly after landing after D-Day, he wandered off in the wrong direction. He was captured by the Germans and spent most of his, his, spent his, most of his time in the war in a German prisoner of war camp. He actually did, later became one of the Army's foremost authorities on prisoners of war, as historians often do. He made the best of his experiences. We actually have a display over here <coughs> about Brooks. Uh, in the prisoner of war camp, he, when they were being uh, chased around by the Russians when they were trying to abandon the camp, he pulled a couple of books out of the library, which he thought that some of his friends would be interested in, and he carried those books with him and brought them back, and, and, and they're now in our collection. Uh, he was inducted into the Infantry Hall of Fame, retired from the U.S. Army Reserve as a colonel. He also is a graduate of Dickinson College, the local Carlisle College, and got his Ph.D. from the University of Pennsylvania. Brooks died a few years ago. These readings were started by his friends and his memory. And as I said, this is going to be a great entry in the series tonight. Colonel Jefferson was born in Detroit, has a bachelor's degree in chemistry and biology from Clark College, which is now Clark, Clark, uh, Clark Atlanta University, as well as a master's degree from Wayne State University. Winner of numerous medals and citations during his tour of duty, including the Purple Heart. He is active in veterans and officers groups, helped establish the Detroit chapter and national organization of the Tuskegee Airmen. He's a member of the Michigan Aviation Hall of Fame, and he served Michigan public schools for 30 years as a distinguished teacher and administrator. He now lives in Detroit, where he remains active as a guest speaker and lecturer. And again, his reputation is, is one that he's, I'm sure he's gonna keep us informed and entertained and we'll all come out of this. So with that, I'll turn the floor over to Colonel Jefferson, sir. Well, let me, let me start off. Am I coming through at the back end? Everybody? School teachers all like to talk to people in the back. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I hope I can come through. Let me start off first of all. I'm like a mosquito flying over a nudist colony. I've got so much to cover. I know what I have to do, but I don't know where to start. <laughs> do I go back to the history of blacks fighting for this country? War of well, the Revolutionary War, War of 1812, uh, war, World War I. Let me just start off. When the draft came along, I'm going to cut this short. When the draft came along in 1939, 1940, 41, Japan, Pearl Harbor, as a draftee, as a black man being, by the way, if I use the word, I might act like you were high school kids. If I use the word Negro, don't get upset. If I use the word African American, don't get upset. Colored, see I've been all of these in all my life. My father was a member of the Marcus Garvey movement, 1925, 26. I remember going to meetings. As a draftee in 1940, 41, as, go, as a buck private, I'd go to the quartermaster. Heavy, nasty, filthy, dirty work. $21 a month, sleeping on the ground. But. Congress allotted $4 million to build Tuskegee Army Airfield, train blacks to fly, because, you know, we can't let these, these Negroes go with these white guys. Integration? No, hell no, no, no. 
Let me back up. Eleanor Roosevelt helped to bring it about in her own particular way. She went down to Tuskegee Institute to, well, she was a member of the Rosenthal Fund. She was a member. And she was going to check up on this money that went to Tuskegee Institute to finance civilian pilot training, CPT. They were teaching young, youngsters at Tuskegee Institute to fly. And she took a ride with Charles Anderson. In the movie, if you saw the movie, the Tuskegee Airmen movie with Fishburn, it shows her sitting in a PT-17. Now how in the heck can a woman of her age climb up and climb over into a Waco or a Stearman? She actually flew in a Piper Cub. You know, it's slow, where you open a door and a woman can sit in it, Piper Cub. She convinced her husband and NAACP, Urban League, the pressure on Congress to spend $4 million to build Tuskegee Army Airfield. See, everything in this country works by money and political pressure. I was fortunate enough to qualify for pilot training. I had to be a college graduate. If I were white, at that stage, I could be a high school dropout and still go to pilot training. See the disparity? Now, Chuck Yeager, fantastic pilot, don't get me wrong. Eyesight, out of this world. But he was a high school dropout. He got his GED after he got out of the Air, Air Force in 47, 48. I had to be a college graduate, Clark College in Atlanta. Majored in chemistry and biology. I minored in physics and math. Then I went to Howard University and put in almost time enough for a master's in organic chemistry. But they called me to Tuskegee to go to pilot training. Pilot training was nine months. Oh, by the way, if you're drafted, you make $21 a month. As a cadet, for nine months, I made $75 a month. And after that, you got your little gold bar and your wings, and you made $150 a month, plus $75 for flying. You got the gold bar, the wings, and all the pretty girls. <laughs> I got news for you. I was a civilian, well, I was a civilian soldier. Our commanding officer was B.O. Davis, the guy who went through West Point. Four years, and they gave him silent treatment. Nobody spoke to him unless it was formally slept by himself, ate, well, he, he caught hell going to the, to the dinner table. Wouldn't let him eat until the last minute. But he was a soldier. Part of the reason why we succeeded as Tuskegee Airmen was because of B.O. Davis, who was a soldier, because we were a raunchy bunch of characters. You talk about... I used to brag about we were young, full of tea and vinegar. Oh, God. That picture of me, it was half of it. And all the rest of the characters that went on before me. We talk about Span Watson, uh, Woody Crockett, uh, Bill, uh, uh, McGee, all these guys. I was lucky enough to finish Tus Tuskegee Army Airfield, and I graduated in January 1944. Now remember now, the whole thing started back in 41. The first class graduated in March 42. Every month you had guys graduating, you call them by groups. 42C, January, February, March, A, B, C. 42D would be January, January, February, March, April. Every month there were anywhere from five to eight to 10 guys graduating. I was fortunate enough to finish. 125 men started, 25 finished. The other guys washed out. When you wash out, you go back to the regular army. Came up to Selfridge Field. Yeah, I might as well cover this. 
Selfridge was where we were flying the P-39, that ignorant airplane with the engine behind you, the Air Cobra, uh, with a big sh a drive shaft through your, through your feet to the propeller. And through the hub of the propeller, there was a 37 millimeter cannon. Every time you fired that sucker, you'd lose five miles of airspeed. You feel it recoil. <laughs> Don't put it into a, a, a turn, because when you try to put it into a, a turn, and try to, and you feel it start to stall, and you're going to make it go anywhere, the damn thing would flip over on you. Never got into that. I was scared to tell you the truth, but we had. Uh, gunnery at Selfridge Field out on Lake Huron. So one day, we we're at the uh, aerial gunnery, shooting at a target towed by another airplane. <coughs> and the radio says, all officers report to the post theater on a double, as you are, which means whatever you're doing, you drop it and you go to the post theater. At the time, there were possibly 40 black officers on post and 150 white officers. The black officers were getting training going back overseas. We're sitting around in the post theater, and somebody said, change up. We popped two, and down the aisle strolls a two-star general. Now, we're all second lieutenants. What the hell's going on? We don't know. He ran it on and on for about five minutes, and then these are the words I remember he said, quote, Gentlemen, this is my airfield. As long as I'm in command, there'll be no socialization between white and colored officers. Are there any questions? If there are, I will deal with that man personally. That was Thursday. They locked the gates. When you lock gates on an officer, that means he's under arrest. Black officers could not leave the post. Saturday morning, they backed in a Pullman train put us on that Pullman train, along with our enlisted men, all of our mechanics, by the way, all mechanics were all black. Train was sealed and it left Selfridge, went to Port Huron, through the tunnel to Canada, went across Ontario to Niagara Falls. To this day, we have never seen PCS orders transferring us from Selfridge Air Force Base in April 44 to Walterboro, South Carolina, Walterboro Air Force Base, 45 miles west of Charleston, 85 miles northwest of Savannah, out in the middle of a swamp. And when the train stopped, every 10 feet, there was a little white soldier with a, full, with a rifle, full battle dress, hand grenades, and all this kind of crap out of it. So we jumped off, we sharp, with pinks and greens, by the way. You remember these pinks and greens? Man, we were sharp. What's going on, buddy? Nothing. They disappeared. Later on, we talked to them. Asked them, hey, what, what are you doing here? They were housekeepers. They were put in full battle dress because there was a, quote, they were told that a bad bunch of in had rioted at Selfridge Field. That's the kind of rep reception we got at Walterboro. How we had to fight for the right to fight for our country. I stayed there about two weeks and then I went overseas. I was a replacement pilot for the 301st Fighter Squadron. We had four squadrons. The 99th, 16 airplanes, 25 pilots and all the enlisted men. They went over to North Africa and started in Morocco and went all around North Africa to Italy, to Sicily. By the time they got to Sicily, three other squadrons were formed, the 100th, the 301st, and the 302nd. I was a replacement pilot for the 301st. I flew 18 and one half missions, 18 long-range missions, escorting B-17s and B-24s from Italy to Germany, Italy to Poland, Italy to Ploesti, Italy to Greece. We had four squadrons, 16 airplanes to a squadron. When the B-17s or B-24s, if the top one, top is at, we'll say, 20,000 feet, 
then the first squadron, 16 airplanes, in flights of four, would be at 21,000. And since the B-17s could only do 160 miles an hour, if we did 160 at 20,000, we'd stall out. So the whole 16 airplanes would do 220 back and forth across the top. Now, the first 99th would be at 21,000. The 100th, 22,000. The 301st, 23,000. The 302nd, 24,000. Sometimes those darn B-17s or B-24s would sit up there at 26,000 feet. So what would they do? Push the first squadron to 27, the next to 28, the next to 29, and one day I found myself sitting up there at 30,000 feet, mushy, you know, you, as you go along and you try to do it, and all of a sudden you feel her quivering, and you know you're getting ready to stall, and you slow up. It's a queasy feeling. But out of it all, I remember starting on a mission, and B.O. Davis would stand at the door, and he'd say, gentlemen, stay with the bombers. We were young and full of tea and vinegar. We wanted to get some victories. Because when we got home, what were your girlfriend going to ask you? Alex, how many Germans did you shoot down? None. <laughs> and that's part of the reason why we have the record of never losing a B-17 or B-24 to German fighters. Because B.O. Davis said, stay with the bombers. And when they did try to come through, hell, we had 64 airplanes to fight them off. 16, 16, 16, 16. Hell, they couldn't get through a lot of times. Too many P-51s in, in front of them. The group also has a record. Oh, they, oh, by the way, they flew P-47s for one month. And while they were flying P-47s, they were up at the head of the Adriatic, coming back from some mission, happened to see a German destroyer sitting in the harbor, went down and strafed it, happened to hit something, and the damn thing blew up. Of course, when he got back, higher headquarters said, hell no, 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 no. But they came back and they had the gun cameras to prove that they hit something on deck or somewhere, and the only record of a fighter sinking a destroyer belongs to the 332nd Fighter Group. That's one of the things we did. Thirdly, I better say this because my, I forget. They, they knocked down three ME-262s with propeller-driven P-51s. Oh, I carry this along with me. If you notice, the tail is beaten, battered, and sh everywhere I go to a school, first thing some kid will do, well, Mr. Jefferson, look at it, and he hit it and knock it off. The propeller is so beat and battered, I take it loose, put it on. I've had to glue it. By the way, I've still got my glue with me. I carry it along. <laughs> but this represents the plane that we flew. And this was the one that was responsible for knocking down ME-262s. Now, admittedly, we believe that the pilots of the ME-262s were very inept. They must not have been on the ball because ME-262s could do 550, close to 600 miles an hour in a dive, close to uh, uh, compressibility. What actually happened, I was talking to Roscoe Brown. Roscoe says that he saw them coming. When they made a dive down through the B-17s, he fell in behind them. The darn thing slowed up. If they had really pushed it to the metal, to the metal, to the floor, they could have gone on through. But we have a record of knocking down ME-262s. Now let me get back to my 18 and one half missions. Long range missions and one day, higher headquarters said, uh, 332nd Fighter Group, go over and knock out some radar stations on the coast of southern France 
previous to the invasion. The invasion came off on the 15th. On the 12th, our job was to knock out these radar stations to prevent them from detecting ships coming across the horizon for the invasion. And at the time, I'm in 301st, and we go into, where well, we take off 15,000 feet over to France, the harbor, and every squadron had a different target. Our target was Toulon. And by the way, I'm tailing Charlie. Four airplanes, oh, flights of four. Four guys go in towards the targets. We're doing about, everything's to the wall. Trying to get in. I don't know how many, how many I was pulling 60 inches on, on, that, on that darn Merlin, getting ready to blow the engine. I was scared because if you go more than 60 and you pull up the little red, uh, red uh, plunger for water, it gets, when you get back, your mechanic is going to kill you, see, because he'll have to take the damn engine and tear it apart. I'm tailing Charlie, and as you know, when one guy starts turning in and he decides to quickly turn, by the time you react, you're back here and you turn, hell, you're a quarter mile behind him. First four guys went through, second four guys went in, and first the radio starts, hey, look at all that fire. God, look at all that damn fire. Some other words, 20, 20 millimeter, ground fire. <laughs> guys start cussing, radio's hot. And by the time I get there, I'm the last guy in the last flight. And when I go across the top of the target, someone says, boom. And I look up, and there's a hole in the top of the canopy. Flipped in. I said, what the hell? And all of a sudden, fire comes up out of the floor right in front of the stick. <sighs> to this day, whenever I talk about this, during my nine months of training, we never had one minute of how to get out of an airplane on fire. <laughs> Not one minute. I look back now, and I can relate automatically to your mind, you said, I've got to get some altitude. Pull back on a stick, and at the same time, down on the left-hand side, you've got the little wheel forward trim tab. You rack in some forward trim tab. There's a little wheel. You turn the wheel. So if you turn the stick loose, the nose will drop. Forward trim tab. It's part of cruise control on your car. Same, same, same attitude, same idea. Pull that sucker up. And the fire is coming up. Now you got, I've got uh, heavy gloves, oxygen mask, uh, flight suit, well protected. But hell, it got hot. I had to get out of this summer again. So as you go up, you reach up on the instrument panel, you pull a little red knob, and the canopy goes off. Then it got up, I said, well, this, I got to go. Turn the stick loose. And when I turned the stick loose, the nose popped. When the nose popped, at the same time, you hit that, you got a big buckle, you got straps across here and straps here, and you hit that buckle and the straps come loose. Well, when the nose popped, I came out. And when I came out, I remember the tail going by with all that fire, and, he, and then to tell you, count to one, two, three, hell no. You put it, <laughs> you, you reach and you pull that sucker, then you look at it and says, God damn it, somebody stole the silk. <laughs> there was a rumor that some guy was taking the silk out of the parachute, selling it to the Italians, <laughs> stuffing the parachute with paper. By the way, they finally caught him. That's another story. Parachute popped. I remember looking at it, and the parachute popped. And when it popped, I'm going down through the trees. All I can see is green. So number one and number two, number three, or number one and two, oh, by the way, number two got shot down at the same time. Danny was scared. He didn't want to bail out, so he put it down in the water, and the Germans went out and picked him up. Parachute popped. I'm going down through the trees, and when I hit the ground, I turn over, and the darn German says, Ja, ach so, ja, Leutnant, Leutnant. I said, oh, hell yes, okay. <laughs> From here, up on the board, it says, oh, by the way, when we were at Stalag Luf 3, Stalag means camp, Luf means air. So Luf Waffe, 
Luft means air, Waffe means army. Luftwaffe is air army. We were in Stalag, Luft, camp controlled by the Luftwaffe. Politically, they were lenient. They treated us with, through the Geneva Convention. I was treated as an officer and a gentleman. In camp, there was American, the senior American officer was, we had military discipline. He's the only guy who spoke to the Germans. I never spoke to the Germans. And we had military discipline because of the Geneva Convention. Kids have asked me, well, Mr. Jefferson, why, why did they have the Hanoi Hilton? I said, because the Japanese and the Far Eastern mind said that you're supposed to fight to the death. You're not supposed to surrender. And if they capture you, they're going to treat you the way their attitude. That's why the Japanese and the Vietnamese treated American soldiers so horribly. Bataan Death March, Hanoi Hilton, and these others. While we were there, didn't have anything to do. Had a tremendous library, because some of the guys had been there three years. Books from home, books from International Red Cross. We had sports equipment, all kinds of sports equipment. Paper, books, and everybody wrote memoirs. You didn't have anything else to do but write memoirs. So these are the memoirs of a Luft gangster. We were called air gangsters by the Germans from Michigan, mostly Detroit. Now, if you know a little math, there I sit. By the way, these ideas floated around from man to man. We, every guy had them, and they changed it according to your own personal place. Uh, up on top, it says 175. Uh, oh, got it. Divided by the third row. Oh, oh, one P51 times 175 20 millimeters divided by the third right equals one POW minus one P51. <laughs> Edited, guaranteed, all the rest is next. Krieg's, Kriegi, Kriegi means war. Kriegi Chronicle. A pilot as Krieg's Gefangenen. Krieg's Gefangenen. Gefangenen is prisoner of war. And it says, um, Sagan. Stalag Luft three was at Sagan, Germany, 80 miles east of Berlin on the Oder River. They also serve and only sit and wait by Milton. See, when you're there, you get philosophical about things like this. Love is a thing women live and men share, but war is a man's work. Next. Next. Remember, listen to this. Here we are at Stella Glove 3, drinking beer at the bar with lovely girls to buy us beer like bloody hell we are. <laughs> you can tell this is from the British. See the British were in there? And uh, when winter comes and, and snows have grown, the temperature is at nil, we'll find hot water bottles in our beds like bloody hell we will. <laughs> and it goes on and on and on. Next. What we wore, uh, if you mind me, hold on just one item momento. I know I brought a, nope, I didn't. See, I thought I brought it, but I didn't. I thought I brought it, but I didn't. Nah. Go prepared, a little laser, rather than try to point up there all the time. When you, for a conservative, you put one battery in upside down to save it. And now when you put it together, will it work? Will it work? Will it work? Bingo. 
heavy gloves, heavy boots, Mae West, oxygen mask, earphones, parachute. These are the things that a pilot would wear. Luf gangster in his heyday. Margot, by the way, was about that tall, had green eyes, hair, about 110 pounds. Margot on my plane. When I got home, some of my good buddies had taken care of Margot. You ever get a Dear John letter? Uh, I got one. Margot. Next. Hitting the blue in the morning. 64 airplanes taking off on one airstrip. There were four squadrons, two squadrons at each end of the, of the airstrip. 16 airplanes to a squadron. Only time I ever got scared sitting there waiting for takeoff. Now you gotta understand something. You're sitting there with 110 gallons underneath each wing. 92 gallons inside of each wing. 85 gallon tank inside sitting behind you. You're parked on side of the end of the airstrip. You're sitting there with your feet on the, on the brakes that damn Merlin is tick, 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 and it wants to go. But meanwhile, the guy sitting next to you, he's got his wing tucked in under yours, and the prop is eating away at your wingtip, and your prop is eating on his wingtip. Then all of a sudden, you look up, and coming down the runway is the first squadron taking off. We are parked less than a hundred feet, a hundred feet from the end of the runway. And these guys are coming down, and you know what happens. The first guy goes off nice and slow. The second guy hits a little turbulence, and by the time number 10 or number 12, he's flipping and flopping, and sometimes the damn things are going across the top of your head. They missed the runway. Only time I ever got scared on takeoff. Then one squadron takes off, then one squadron this way takes off, then the other number three takes off, then number four takes off. 64 airplanes off of one airstrip. Meanwhile, everybody is circling Luffberry overhead, led by B.O. Davis Jr. All 64 airplanes take off in less than five minutes. God, listen, when B.O. Davis says jump, you jump. Have you ever been dressed by a full bird colonel? Yeah, I was uh, caught one day and he, well, we won't get into that. <laughs> <laughs> Next, please. Coming back home. Everybody's low on gas. You see there are no, no wing tanks? But everybody's almost dry. And you better get your tail off the end of the runway quick because four or five guys are right behind you. At least three guys on, on the runway at the same time. Another time, you almost get scared. Part of our job was to bring home B-17s and B-24s. Many times we'd fly along, coming back to Italy, and get these guys who are all shot up and we would escort them coming back. We caught back many and many and many of B-17s, bringing home a cripple. Next. Oh no. By the way, what's S-2? Intelligence. Always telling us where the flak was. And damn it, when we got there, it's never there. It's somewhere else. They used to tell us Klagenfurt or Wiener Neustadt. And damn it, when we got over there, no, it wasn't there, it was over Vienna. Always, please, intelligence, and the, by the way, that, I drew that because that's Toulon, the harbor of Toulon. Please don't tell me. See the cartoon? 
It's the way we, we draw things like that. Next. If I had not s written this down approximately a month after it happened, I would not remember that I was shot down August the 12th, 1944 by ground 20 millimeter strafing radar stations at uh, southern France at Toulon Harbor at 1047. Who would remember 1047? Hit by shell up through the floor, went at about 50 feet. Cockpit on fire, pulled up and bailed out at about, it says 800 feet. I think it was, I don't know. Captured immediately, taken in small garrison and so forth and so on. The only reason why I can remember that because I wrote it down. Next. This is the way I drew this picture. I imagine it looked. That's me right there on the left. That's Margot. When we got there, the radar stations, these guys were, that's, by the way, that's number one, number two, number three, number four. I saw Danny when he got hit. He was scared, so he, he didn't want to bail out. So he turned around and put it down in the water, and the Germans went out and picked him up. One, number one, and number th two, n number one and three, they got through. When they got back to the squadron, they reported that they, when, when I went across the top of the target and pulled up and came out, the airplane went in. When they looked back, they saw the airplane go in. They didn't see me get out. So they sent a home a KIA telegram to my parents. And I landed right there, somewhere close by. Next. This is the way it appeared to me just before I got to the target. Sitting in there, you see the instrument panel, and I saw number, see Danny go off to the side. I remember him going off out of my peripheral vision. I could see him, the smoke, and that's number three. He got hits, and I got hits, and the next, bingo, I'm coming out. I remember the tail going by with all that fire, plunging into new adventure. Now, in the background, oh, this is significant. Notice the mountains in the background. About three weeks ago, I got an email from a guy in France. He read the book, and he said, Colonel, I found where your airplane went in. And he's also found a youngster who was a witness who was about two or three hundred yards away. So I've got to go back to France and see this place. And maybe I can get a piece of my airplane, who knows. But I remember the mountains. And it's very odd because when you're going in at 400 miles an hour, you don't have time enough to sit there and admire the landscape. <laughs> and I drew this picture about a month afterwards. I remember the mountains in the background. Next. Ah, Lafayette, we are here. That's an exaggerated, that's an exaggerated, the way I arrived. Those are heavy boots, gloves, and, uh, but that's part of it. Next. That speaks for itself. I wanted wings, wind up at Stalaglov 3, SUD, S-U-D, that's south, POW number 7538. Cadet dog tags over Alabama. Officer dog tags over Italy. POW dog tags over Germany, with a big question mark, the future. I did this in 1944. Notice that the German dog tag is perforated down the middle, because if you're killed, they break it in half, stick one in your mouth, and then send, send the other to grave registration. See, we carry two dog tags. 
but the Germans had only one, but it was perforated. Next. My journeys from Italy to France, up the Rhone Valley through Vignon, Orange, by train, by truck to Lyon, by train to Frankfurt on the, on the Frankfurt, on the Rhine. This is where I was interrogated. I get to this place and they know more about me than I know about myself. They had my, oh, they had everything about me. They knew my high school had all my records. I would go to Clark College, they had all my marks. Howard University, they had all my marks. They even knew how much taxes my dad paid on his house. When I got home, I could understand why, because you can go down to your county office and you can look up your tax record of any of your neighbors and find out how much taxes. But somebody was here sending stuff back to Germany. I wound up at, over here at Stalag Luft III. And when the Russians started coming through in January 1945, they put us out on the road and we walked 80 kilometers west to keep away from being uh, ca recaptured by the Russians. And hell, we didn't want to be ca recaptured by them anyway. We knew about them. And we finally wound up at Mooseburg, Stalag 7A. Next. Next. This is the way I envision Stalag Luft III looking. To keep from going stark raven nuts, we walked the perimeter. Somebody said uh, some kind of therapy. Well, you get out here and you walk the perimeter all the way around, just walking. You'd be surprised. Some of the guys would go stark raven nuts because they were behind barbed wire, wanting to escape. But we didn't need to escape because we were listening to BBC radio. Now, not the German radio. How many of you guys ever make a small radio with a earphone and a cat whisker and a razor blade? We listened to BBC. We knew what the hell, we knew what the war was going. We, everything was happening. Some of these guys were still so, they couldn't take it. We'd have to tie them up at night to keep them from going stark raven nuts want to go out and try to cut their way out of the barbed wire. And if they tried to cut their way out of that barbed wire, the German guard would shoot them because there were lights all around. But my barracks was right here, I believe. Uh, that was a bathhouse. One of those was a theater. Notice the <coughs> basketball court. We had baseball, hockey, basketball, you name it. We had all kinds of equipment. Part of the therapy was walking the circuit. Uh, notice it was a pine forest. It was built on an old pine forest, so there were sandy soil, very sandy. Next. Here's the building I was in. Here's the barracks. Hall down the middle. Oh, first of all, there was East Camp, Center Camp, North Camp, South Camp, and West Camp. All together, there were 5,000 officers who had been shot down over German-occupied territory. 5,000 white officers. And we find out that each one of them, the Germans had information on every one of them. There were 32 black officers at the end of the war. I was number four. I was number four going into Stalag Group three. By the time the war ended, there were 32 of us in different camps all put together. I was in South Camp, by the way. Each one of these were surrounded by, notice the configuration. Each one surrounded by 10-foot barbed wire. Next. 
Went to a convention. Here's an X, here's a picture. Before we got into Stellar Glove 3, they put us in tents. The place was so crowded. These are mainly British and American in tents before we got into the barracks. This is a picture I took at a convention. Next. There are more pictures of the crowded conditions. Next. An actual picture of Stalag Le 3. Cold, oh my God, you talk about cold. Temperature 15, 20 below zero. These are the tents we went into temporarily before going into the barracks. Each room had to take an extra man. They had double bunks in, in each room. So they take out the double bunk and put in a triple bunk. And an extra man went into each room. Another picture. There's, there's the main gate, by the way. And stark reality of prison camp. I took this picture because one of the prisoners was shot at night. He was not supposed to be standing in a doorway. But the, the, the door was open. He was standing there, and the Germans shot him while I was there. I remember that incident. But that, I took this picture of a, by the way, this was at a convention oh, about eight or nine, ten years ago. I just took a picture of it. Semper in excretia. Anybody know Latin? Come on now. Always in excretia. Uh, up at the top, the old fickle finger of fate. <laughs> Smoker. And of course, the goon box. We call the Germans goons. After, what was that character in Popeye? The character with a big nose and the old Popeye cartoon it was called a goon. Well, we call the Germans goons. But the, always in the excretia. And here's a, li the, here's a list of block 128, there's building 128, room 8. And here are the guys who are there. And notice I'm second from the bottom. And right above that is Erickson. And where's Gil? There's Gil. Today, Gil lives in Detroit. Erickson lives in Detroit. At the time, we had no idea they were in Detroit. They were living somewhere else. Next. This is the way the room looked. 16, yeah, 16 foot square. Triple bunk, triple bunk, double, double. Two bunks here, two here, three there. Table in the middle, stove, two chairs and a window. That's called the cell. We call it the cell. 16 foot square. Next. I drew this picture of the room. Two double bunks, and the guys are sitting there knitting. Didn't have anything else to do, by the way, getting ready for the winter. We knitted socks, scarves, uh, caps, and mufflers. Notice the table. No place to hang your clothes. Typical room, style of three. Next. There's a triple bunk. My bunk was on top, next to the door. Double bunk, table. Notice the seat. Next. An actual picture of the room. I was at a convention about eight, nine, ten years ago, and they had these pictures. There's a triple bunk, the table, chair, clothes hanging up. Now I see this 60 years after I draw my picture and said, yep, here it is. Validates. Next. The other side of the room, there's a stove. Every guy had a cup, 10 cups. There's a triple bunk. And... Uh, there's that German bread. A loaf of bread, 50% sawdust. 
And on the bottom of it was the date. Some of it was 10 and 12 years old. The date was stamped on the bottom where they had it in storage. They go out to a big barn and damn things are, you know, stored. They give you five or six of them, and take them back to the room. Sawdust because it are substance to fill your stomach. Next. Uh, washroom, only had three down the, down the hall. Nobody ever used them. They were too crowded, so we took a bath in a, in a tin tub. Next. Library, an extensive library. Some of the guys have been there two and three and four years. Books from home, science library, extensively. You get yourself a seat. The seat was made out of a Red Cross. Still going through? Okay. Hmm. Oh boy. Well, did that make it? Okay, I'm still there. Next. The honey wagon. <coughs> uh, there was a outdoor toilet. Hell, the damn thing was long as from here to that wall, with a wall down the middle and seats on each side. And the, the old Polish guy with a big mustache would come and put the old tube down in there, and he'd start pumping. And when he's pumping, he'd reach in his rear pocket, pull out his lunch sandwich, and start eating on his sandwich. <laughs> I didn't draw him in the picture. I said it would be too... God, I thought... Next. Oh, that, there it is. An actual picture of the inside of a latrine. There's the wall down the middle. Seats on each side. See how wide it is, how big it is? He was pumping the stuff out of the bottom. Okay, next. One stove in the barracks down at the end in a room. And each room was scheduled to use the oven for baking on a schedule. That's how we use it. And notice the one sink. Next. Red Cross food parcels. On the left is what the Germans gave us. On Monday, sauerkraut, honey, and barley. Oh, each day we got potatoes. On Tuesday, barley soup, like a gruel. Black bread, margarine, and sauerkraut. Nothing on Wednesday. Thursday, barley again, that's soup. Friday, pea soup, uh, jam, 13 ounces, black bread again, and Saturday, potatoes and some sugar. Potatoes every day. If it had not been for International Red Cross food parcels, we were supposed to get a parcel per man per week. But we only got a half. So in this room of 10 men, they give us five parcels. Each parcel had clem, that's powdered milk, a can, margarine, a pound, crackers, a D bar. That's that chocolate bar. Any guy remember those chocolate bars? The worth of gold. In the barracks, there was one sergeant. And his job was to take the D-bars outside the camp and trade them with the Polish peasants for eggs. Each D-bar was worth six eggs. So he would get six eggs, keep one, and we would get the five. Trading, he was a real businessman. Sugar, raisins, a box of raisins, a box of prunes, three to nine packs of cigarettes. They made smokers out of us. The reason why lung cancer among World War II vets is so high, everybody was smoking. Movie stars were smoking. We all smoked. Red Cross food, cheese, Nescafe, 
small can of salmon, liverwurst, six ounce, prem, spam, 12 ounce, roast beef, 12 ounce, Red Cross food parcels. They kept us alive. Okay. Here's a cartoon. Two Kriegies opening up a, with clam, spam, with a food, food parcel. Next. A real food parcel. This is what it really looks like. It, was, it looked like gold when it came. You were, we were hungry, and every time they'd come in with, see the clam? That's milk, it was powdered milk. Salmon, corned beef, spam, liverwurst, sugar, honey grams, soap, raisins. This is why I donate to the International Red Cross. It was a lifesaver. Prisoner of War food package. Next. How do I explain a creaky burner? You could take a piece of wood the size of your hand, split it up in small splinters, put it right there, light it, turn this crank, and if you know the principles of one, that's five to one, inside of this there's a little fan. All of this was put together, by the way, with the cans from Clem and those uh, previous cans, we took them apart and we made this creaky burner. Right? Force draft air into this burner. We could take a piece of wood and boil a gallon of water with this force air heat. It's called a creaky burner. Next. Saturday night blues. Sit there and turn records, smoke cigarettes and drink and think about the girl back home and all the good times you're missing. Next. A couple of guys got caught with a pair of wire cutters. Oh, the guy looking in the window is a ferret, a German's guard. His job was to sneak around and see what's going on to make sure that no escape uh, plans were being made. And those guys spent two weeks in the cooler on, on uh, bread and water. They cut Vasi's loose, what is loose? They got caught with, with uh, wire cutters. Hmm, your boyfriend's a POW, huh? Well, 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 well. Look at that, <laughs> look at that coat. Coming back in style, look at it. Look at the chain. Yeah, he's a, no, I not talk about <laughs> Next. Wine, women, and song. Creaky dream. After the first week, you forget about the wine. The second month, you forget about the music. Third week, you forget about the women. What do you remember? Food. Food. I've heard people say, oh, I feel so hungry. I say, kid, you've never been hungry. You've never been hungry till you lose five or six pounds. Some of the guys have been there three or four or five years. They lost 15 to 20 pounds. I only lost six pounds. I was only there nine months. Next. Stalag nightmares. Some of the guys on bombers really had nightmares because they were the only ones that got out of those B-17s on fire. Some of the some of the guys had some horrible nightmares. Next. Sunday morning, sack time. Only morning you didn't have to get up and go out and stand and review for the German to come down and count. You know, eins, zwei, drive, counting up. Sunday morning, the only morning you didn't have to go up for morning checkup. Next. Raisins, sugar, uh, rice, potatoes, with a little, little yeast, what do you get? Ah, creaky brew. Creaky brew. Creaky brew. 
What's the A boy? <laughs> Bathroom. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Some of the guys really. <laughs> you it was potent. I don't know what proof it was, but hell. It, <laughs> it was potent. God, we <laughs> Next. Draft Dodger. Uh, there's a poem that goes along with this. But all of this style is coming back in style. Look at it. Peg leg pants, long, big wide brim hat. Next. Ah, say I ain't got troubles, huh? There he is sitting there with his girlfriend back with all these guys. That's why I got uh, creaky. I got a letter. Next. Uh, we were built over a pine forest, stumps, between the 10-foot fence and that small fence that we couldn't cover. When we got permission from the Germans to go over and pull up the stumps in order to burn the stump in our stove, and each room had a day to use a stump puller. The old principle of this lever on this, see the little grab and pull, this will pull down, which means come up about two or three inches. Then the other guy would raise theirs up, it would go down and grab and pull. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'm the only guy who weighed 110 pounds, so I had the job of sidewalk superintending. <laughs> I wasn't heavy enough. <laughs> Next. Uh, American Airmen, they, they thought we were look gangsters, which we were. American Air Gangs, they thought we were after women, we, we were. Next. Oh, dear Lieutenant, I think that it's right that you know that I am married to Jack so-and-so, and we're very happy, and we'd like you to come, make sure you come and visit us. Dear John, that's a Dear John letter. Some of the guys went stark, raving nuts because the girlfriend back home married some other guy. Some of the guys never got over it. Me? Well, I had another girlfriend, too, so what the hell. <laughs> Next. <laughs> this was down at Stellog 7A, down near Munich. Some of the guys came out and said, hey, Jeff, come on out here. The P-51s are strafing the city. I go out there, and I see these P-51s strafing the town of, of Mooseburg. They're red tails. There are four of them. They got a Luffberry, you know, you, you, you fire, you pull up, you go down, you go down on the base, uh, downwind leg, then the base leg, you turn and you fire again. These four P-51s are shooting up the railroad station. I saw them, that's why I drew that picture. Next. Ah, went out to the Air Force Academy, Colorado Springs, thumbing through some photographs of Air Force pictures, and said, hey, there's me. Picture taken on Liberation Day, 29 April, 1945. Patton's Third Army had just come down and liberated the camp we were in. We were near Munich, and they had him duplicate the picture and send me the picture. There, I could tell those boots and the cap. Liberation Day, which proves I was at Stalag 7A. We were there for about two days. And somebody said, hey, Jeff, there's a place down there with a lot of dead people. What in the hell are you talking about? Man, they got dead people down there stacked up like cordwood. Like cordwood. So we're curious. We got a Jeep. We went to see this place with all these dead people. You could smell it a mile before you got to it. In your neighborhood, on Saturday, Everybody's barbecuing. And the odor of barbecue drifts throughout your whole neighborhood. And when freedom came along, quite naturally, there was ethnic hatred. What happened in Yugoslavia? What happened in Kosovo? 
teach our kids today about ethnic hatred. What's going on in Iraq today? Do you know the difference between a Sunni and a Shiite? If you don't know the difference, well, I can't cuss and call you a damn fool, but you don't know, you got an, you've got an internet, you've got a computer, pull up Google. Pull up Google on your internet and put in Sunni and Shiite. The reason why our boys are being killed over there right now, where the Sunnis and Shiites can't get together and get a government going. And we're catching hell. Bush is catching hell. Rumsfeld, that's the world today. I go back and I talk about this to high school kids and to adults who literally sit fat, dumb, and happy, not knowing what the hell is going on in this world and why we are in the condition we're in, what we have inherited. Dachau, so many dead bodies, they couldn't bury them. They took a big bulldozer and dug a big trench as far as the head of that wall, and they pushed them over in there and covered them over with lime. I only saw Dachau. I did not see Buchenwald or many of the others. But I said, when I get home, I'm going to make sure that somebody is going to understand man's inhumanity to man to get an idea about why we fight, why this country is so great. I've been told, well, Jeff, you know, you're, you're black, you're colored, you go back to Africa. I said, God damn it, I've, I've got five generations in this country. I go back to my great-great-grandfather, 1805. I tell Germans, you Germans go back to Germany. It, Italians go back to Italy, all the others. This is my country. I go back and I talk about black men who fought. First guy who fell in the Revolutionary War. Who was it? There you go. First man in the Revolutionary War. War of 1812. Civil War. I talk about the Civil War when they had so many regiments of blacks. They only kept two the 9th and 10th, and sent them out to far west. They call them the Buffalo Soldiers. They cry, oh, the Buffalo Soldiers are so brave. I said, God damn it, for what? For killing Indians. Killing Indians, Native Americans. That's me, that's my attitude about life in this country. I came home after, next, oh, that's all. I came home after, ah, that's my significant other. <laughs> Taken about uh, 10 years ago when I was enshrined into the Michigan Aviation Hall of Fame. My significant other. One more? These are the four guys who went down on that same mission. This was done in 1970. Yeah, there's me, I was with a beard that time. Now that's Danny. Danny was chicken, he didn't want to bail out. So he put it down in the water. Macon was at a different target at Montpellier. O'Neill was lucky. That son of a gun bailed out over, the, uh, over France and the free French the Free French Marquis got him back. So we were the four who went down on that same mission. My life as a Tuskegee Airman, as you can imagine, I've enjoyed it. I've had one hell of a good time. I've had some rough times, but mainly I've enjoyed it. Came back and became a school teacher. Tried to get a job as a chemist. And everywhere I went, I was, quote, overly qualified. Overly qualified. Couldn't even wash test tubes for 
Park Davis. So I became an elementary science school teacher. And to tell you the truth, I think it's the best goddamn thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> I now have 40-year-olds and 50-year-olds who come up and say, hey, you're Miss Jefferson. I said, yeah. Oh, I said, hey, wait a minute. It must have been Pattongill School or Ferry. And they talk about some school. Life has been good. God has been very good to me. Very good to me. Still surviving. And I hope I have some more golden years. Yes? When did your parents find out that you were? I went down in August. They found out about three months later. August, September, October. End of October that I was a POW when the International Red Cross had been in and got the report and they sent back uh, telegram POW. My mother's hair turned white. Bingo. Just like that. Worry, stress. Yeah, others? Yes, over here. Ah. <laughs> little stinker. <laughs> he asked, did I fly a bubble canopy or a Razorback? I flew the Razorback. I was supposed to get a bubble canopy the next day. When I got back, I was supposed to get a bubble canopy. But I was flying a Razorback, the C model. See, the bubble canopy is a D. Yeah. Over there. It was done in March 45. Over Berlin. Yeah. They were escorting B 17s. And ME 262s made a pass, fell in right behind them. Very inept German pilots. They were strictly off the ball. If they'd shoved everything to the wall and kept going, they would have got away. But they slowed up. And that's when the P 51s, Roscoe Brown and Earl Lane. Yes? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were 100 miles faster than P 51s. Yes, sir. Me? None. <laughs> I didn't shoot down any. I never got a chance to. <laughs> yes? Positive attitude. Number one. In the first place, let me be very kind. Life was hell. I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> I grew up in an era where black men were less than dogs, considered less than men. I grew up in an era where I was oh, con constantly seeing the newspapers with the Scottsboro boys. These were the nine young black boys in Alabama riding a freight train accused of rape by two white girls. Accused. They were innocent. But I saw this as part of the fact that even in the Army, I was a second class citizen. So when I got shot down in POW camp, it wasn't hell, it was no big deal. No big deal at all. Because first of all, now let me let me go back. My mother and my father taught me that everybody in the world is crazy except you and me. All these stupid, idiotic, non compliant look at them, stupid, no good so-and-sos. We are the only ones who could understand how intelligent we are. The only ones who knew that our inner. So when they call me a nigger, he has no idea what the hell he's talking about. I'm not a nigger. He's stupid. He's ignorant. Therefore, I treat everybody else. When they call me a bit dirty name, that's their business. I, I'm not going to get mad because I found out. When you call me a dirty name and I start reacting, that means you got me on a, and you're playing me like a damn fool. And I react. And you're sitting back there, uh-huh, I got him. Look at him. Every now and then, I think about it. Everybody's crazy except you and me. And at certain times, I'm not so sure about you. <laughs> It protects me as a human being. 
not to be affected by what you say. I refuse to jump on a stick just because somebody calls me a lousy, crummy, stinking, no good SOB. I may be lousy, crummy, but I'm not going to admit it. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. Yes. While you were POW, were you treated differently by the Germans or your other American officers because you're black? No. Treated as an, I was treated as an officer and a gentleman. Now, when I first got there, I knew that some of those white guys had been in POW camp for two or three years. They did not know that blacks were flying. But military discipline made them accept me until two weeks later, a B-17 crew came in. And a B-17 crew saw me, ran over and grabbed me and said, hey, God damn it, if you guys had been with me, we wouldn't have been shot down. <laughs> and the rest of the guys in camp said, what the hell are you talking about? He said, the red tails, man, the red tails will bring you back home. Spread out through the whole camp. The blacks were flying, P-51, red tails. See, because there were four groups in Italy. Three white groups and one black. One group was the yellow tails. You could identify the 52nd by the yellow tail. The other was checkerboard, 325th. Checkerboard, 325th. And the third was the uh, red and white stripe, 31st. And of course, we were the red tails. Anytime you saw a checkerboard P-51 over Germany, you knew it was the 332nd fighter group. And Reputation of Tuskegee Airmen. By the way, we were not Tuskegee Airmen then. We, didn't, uh, we were not Tuskegee Airmen until 1972, when the organization started in 1972. Started in my house, by the way. A bunch of guys got together and said, hey, let's get together and have a reunion. Where are we going to go? Well, let's go to Jeff's house. Jeff doesn't have any old lady. <laughs> <laughs> so they came and organized the first reunion and drank up all my liquor. <laughs> but it started in my house in Detroit in 1972. Next question. Any others? Yes. No. I do not know of anything like that. Uh, I, I heard that there were some black pilots, officers, that were killed in Bucharest, reported by some whites who witnessed it. They don't know their names. Uh, when the war ended, there were 32 of us who were POWs. In the diff there were four, four different camps in Germany. Altogether, there were 32 out of our group who were POWs. And in my book, I've made the list of them. In fact, in that book, there's a list of them. I'm the only guy to keep a list of them, by the way, out of the 332nd Fighter Group with the history of when they, went, when they went down, their home, and all these other things. I never heard of any separate camp for blacks. Before I leave, I'll give you the book and the article. Great. And I'll make, I'll make sure, make sure you see him. Any other questions? Go ahead, yeah. What was it like to be the next uh, Mark of Tuskegee Airmen? We had a job to do, and we did the job. Period. We had a job to do, and we did the job. And uh, beyond that, there are no more accolades. We did the job. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Beautiful. Good. 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 Thank you. Please, please be seated for a second. I'd like to present Colonel Jeffrey with a small memento of his, of his ah. visit here. A copy of his, uh, of the, the poster we used to announce his presence. Something you can kind of remember us by as well. 
We've been honored by your presence here tonight. We really have. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I want to take a picture. <laughs> Sir, we'll give you plenty of time. <laughs> the uh, evidence so when I get home, <laughs> my okay. significant. We'll see, I'm away for three days. At, I, I, I run my life. <laughs> my significant other is going to wonder, where in the hell have you been? 